Well, tonight we have a couple of special guests, and it's great that we could have Kevin and Karen Prevost with us, missionaries to Spain. And the Prevost have been involved in evangelism, pastoring, and church planting in Spain since 1985. And as they continue their ministry there, they will they continue to be involved, and they'll share this, I'm sure, with detail and open-air evangelism. But they also are training soul winners across Spain, Europe and Latin America, the Lord's been opening up doors of opportunity for them to be able to train individuals to go out and do the work of the evangelists, which all of us have been called to do. And also, Karen is working with Project Rescue Spain, where she's ministering to at-risk women and women who have been victims of human trafficking, and I'm sure that she'll share some of that with us as well. So please, and after they're done sharing with us and presenting all that God has put on their hearts, then we're going to take time to pray for several things that I'm sure they'll share with us, as, especially as Pastor Kevin shares the word, and then we want to pray for their ministry as well as ministries that are taking place all around us. So we want to give a warm AACC missionary welcome to Kevin and Karen. Kevin Prevost as they come this evening. God bless them. Are we on? Yep. I'm sure you would all agree that slavery is one of the most shameful parts of our history. Today, it is unthinkable to own another human being because of the color of their skin. But did you know that today there are 27 million slaves in the world, mostly a result of human trafficking, women and children being bought and sold? But worse still, there might even be slaves among us here today, slaves to sin. Because when you're not totally honest about what you've done or who you are, you become more and more enslaved to deceit and to, sin and to lies. Or when someone has hurt you deeply and you relive that scene in your mind over and over and over again and use your words to make that person look small in the eyes of others or secretly rejoice when they fail, you become more and more enslaved to bitterness, unforgiveness, and even to hate. Or when you're on internet and you click on that porn page and indulge in those fantasies and thoughts or take the next step and have intimate relations with someone that you are not married to, you become more and more enslaved to lust and immorality. And try as you might, you cannot break your own chains. And the problem is not only living this life enslaved to sin, but the other end of these chains will one day pull you down to an eternity far from God. So what hope do you have? How can you get rid of these chains? The only way to set a slave free is to purchase their freedom. And 2,000 years ago when Jesus got up on that cross, he took your chains with him, and he paid for your freedom with every drop of his blood. And his resurrection proved the price was paid in full. Jesus is the only one who can break your chains. But the choice comes back to you because you can choose to continue to live like this. But tonight, if you know that you have chains in your life, you can tell him right now, Jesus, I don't want to live anymore with lust and immorality, with bitterness and unforgiveness, with deceitfulness and lies. Take my chains, take my sin, take my whole life. I want to follow you. I choose you. And when you tell him that, he will break those chains off of you and give you the freedom and the power to live a life that pleases him. Why would you live one more day enslaved to sin? Give your whole life to Jesus today. So what you've just seen is what takes place six nights a week in downtown Madrid, Spain. We're part of the uh, ministry called On the Red Box. We go out to the central plaza of Madrid called the Puerta del Sol, where 120,000 people walk through every single day. 
and we proclaim Jesus just like you saw. And over the years, people have been coming to us and wanting to learn. And so we actually started a local training program and an online training program for people in other countries that were wanting to, to start teams. And over the last several years, more than 5,000 people have been through our training programs. And there are really now more than 60 Red Box teams across Spain, Europe, and Latin America. And a team is a group of five people with a trained leader that go out at least once a week and proclaim Jesus in their plazas and in their parks and public squares where people gather. And you've had a part of that. And we want to thank you for that. We had a miracle this take place just a few months ago. We had been renting uh, our ministry center that overlooks the plaza. This is like Times Square, New York. And uh, the owner came in and said, you know, I don't want to rent anymore. Your contract's up. You either purchase it or you leave. And so we started to pray. And God started putting pieces into place and giving us the go-ahead. We had a, a small church give a huge donation of $100,000, when that was pretty encouraging for us to move on ahead. And in about 10 months, the Lord, through his people, through you, helped provide almost a million dollars to purchase that ministry center, which is prime property uh, in, right in the heart of Madrid. So we own a piece of that plaza, and God's got things in store. If he gives us a permanent place there. He's got things in store. Praise the Lord. So we want to thank you for sewing into that. And also, as Pastor Cal mentioned, I've been coming alongside a ministry called Project Rescue Spain that does minister to women that are coming out of human trafficking. We have a safe home. And out there in the entryway, we have a table, some jewelry, handcrafted jewelry that the women make as part of the program. And uh, all of the proceeds go to help support them in the safe home. Also, there's some note cards. This is from a, a painting that I did that hangs in the safe home. And it's just as a symbol of the home, from darkness into light. The home is called New Beginnings, and that's what we tell the women. That's you. That's you. You have a chance for a new beginning. And without Jesus, that new, new beginning doesn't happen. That's all very Christ-centered. So we also encourage you to pick up a new prayer card. We need you to pray. We're so thankful to be here on a prayer night. We need you to pray. God's got things in store, but we can't do it on our own. We need the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and that's where you come in. You're, you extend your hands and your hearts, and, and we see God move. And then one more thing I wanted to mention. This is actually part of our evangelism training. If you feel frustrated sometimes in evangelism, don't know how to start a conversation, don't know where to go with it, this will help you be able to do that work of the evangelist with the people around you, with your family, friends, neighbors, colleagues. Um, this is all part of our training, and it's very simple and effective. And we just encourage you, you can pick one of these up for $2 or go on our website, ontheredbox.com, download it for free. You can even be part of our school for free and learn how to be more effective in sharing Jesus wherever you are. So I just want to thank you for sowing into lives. Don't ever stop sowing into souls. That's an eternal reward. And together, let's continue to break those chains physically and spiritually over people. Amen? Thanks, Karen. Good evening. I'll back up so you don't you don't need a shower, right? The uh, well, I'm glad to be here on a prayer meeting evening. What I want to do tonight um, is share with you some of the dealings of the Lord in my life over some last seven years or so. And uh, well, I've been a missionary for 32 years. But you know, that's not my purpose in life. You know, do you know what your God-given purpose in life is? I could say, you know, I know God's will for my life is that, that I'd be a missionary, but that's not his purpose for my life. If I were to ask you, do you know what your real purpose in life is? Could you answer that? Well, you know, we really all have the same purpose, and we see this all through the Bible. We were created for God's glory. That is our purpose in life, that our lives, through our lives, God should receive glory. And uh, let's give me, let me just give you a couple of verses that talk about this. Jesus said it this way, that they may see your good works and glorify my Father in heaven. You know, this is to my Father's glory 
that you bear much fruit. Whatever you do, Paul's talking about eating and drinking. He says, whatever you do, do it all for the God's glory. You know, there's a lot of verses that talk about this and uh, that we are created for God's glory. You know, and it seems like, man, that's pretty basic. You know, that's, that seems pretty simple. <laughs> but, you know, I really didn't really understand this until I'd been in ministry probably 25 years. You know, because we get confused with God's will, you know, and his purpose for our lives. And a lot of the other ministers I talk to say the same thing. You know, that we really, and I've come to see that, to really understand that our purpose is for God's glory. And when we, we don't see that, and uh, that isn't the center part of our life, in the central in our lives, our lives don't run very smoothly. They're, our lives are kind of really out of balance. Uh, spiritually. When I was thinking about this, it, it reminded me of the clowns at the circus. Now, I'm not calling you a clown, but just follow me here. The, uh, you might have seen this. Some of these clowns at the circus have these special bicycles. And these bicycles, you know that the axle hub of a wheel should be right in the very center of the wheel. But these clowns have these bicycles where the axle hub is offset. It's off center in the front wheel and the back wheel. So when the clowns get on these bicycles to ride them, they're going up and down, weaving sideways, you know. And it's pretty funny to watch because they're so unbalanced, you know. Has, has anybody ever seen that? Yeah. And uh, I thought, man, that is so much like us as Christians when God's purpose isn't central in our life. Our life is really out of balance. And if we're not careful, we end up becoming high-maintenance Christians. Have you ever seen yourself as a high-maintenance Christian? Well, that's what happens when we don't live for the purpose we were created for. You know, it can't not have happen. The, but when we really start to live for God's glory, man, I'm here for one thing, for God's glory, you'll see that your life will become a lot more stable. I'm not saying necessarily you'll have, any, you'll have less problems in life, but when problems do hit your life, you'll be like Jesus, like Paul, like, okay, this bad thing's happened, I'm in jail. God, how can you glorify yourself through this bad situation? And it, it's no longer about you and how you feel and your emotions, you know. Woe is me, why does all these bad things happen to me? You know, that's just a sign that self is still at the center. But when you live for God's glory, okay, God, what do you want to do in this situation? It just brings so much more stability to our lives. Well, God being glorified in our lives is one of the main reasons we really need to be full and baptized in the Holy Spirit. You know, so his power can flow through, as, as Jesus said, like as rivers of living water flowing out of us to meet the, uh, in all types of different good works. Good works, I kind of just um, give a definition of good works. A good work is anything that ministers to other people, okay? And that's, that's his great need, this power of the Holy Spirit. You know, when we think about the baptism, we usually think spiritual gifts. And sure, that's a big part of it, but what it is, it's power to minister to others. You know, especially in that verse, and we know that, the famous verse, where Jesus said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Well, I had a, I had a problem with this verse for many years, probably for about six years. You know, I got saved when I was about 19, 20 years old, baptized in the Spirit a couple months after that, and still baptized in the Spirit, <laughs> praying in tongues and personal prayer around the every day. But I, this is the problem I had with it. I said, God, I know I'm baptized in the Spirit. I know many of my friends are baptized in the Spirit. But God, how is it that we can be baptized in the Holy Spirit and have so little power? It was just an enigma to me. I, can't, I couldn't figure it out. And I just kept calling out to God probably for about six years. God, how, how is this possible? Well, one day he answered me when I was reading in Acts 2.18. Old Testament, there we go. Um, where Jesus, it says, even on my servants, Acts 2.18, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they'll prophesy. And as I read that, you know how the, you can read a verse and the Lord just speaks to you so clearly through it? And it's like the Lord spoke to my heart and said, Kevin, my power is for my servants. And I thought, well, aren't we all servants of God? 
And then he clarified it. My power is for those who live for my interest. My power is for those who live for my interest. Well, that just gives a whole different picture. If you really think of what a servant is, a servant lives for the interest of his master, right? But that's, you know, so we need to ask ourselves, do we really live for God's interest, right? And uh, we're all trying and to grow in holiness because a holy life brings glory to God. Don't want to minimize that in any way. And we're making progress there, not as fast as we like to hope, you know, at times. We thought it was going to be faster, but we're making progress there. But think with me just for a moment about our prayer lives, okay? What are the, what are the main things that dominate our prayer lives? My marriage, my lack of marriage. Wait, God, where's my spouse? Um, our kids, right? Our jobs, our lack of jobs, you know, my house, my car. And, and the older you get, there's something that kind of moves right up to the top of that prayer list. It's called your health. Oh, your grandkids. Oh, yeah. Oh, I forgot those. Those, they would be on the top of the list, right? And those, and those are the main things that we pray about day in and day out, aren't they? And there's nothing wrong with that, you know, and, um, and God cares about those things. And he, he tells us that he does. But it seems to me that, uh, that these are almost non-issues to him, the things that so concern us. Kevin, are you saying my kids are a non-issue to God? Are you saying my marriage is a non-issue to God? Well, before you throw any stones, let me just read how Jesus said this exact same thing. He said it this way. But seek first, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness in all these other things will be taken care of. Matthew 6, 33, right? It's, it's like saying, put my interests first, keep them in first place, and I'll look out for all of your interest. That's a promise from the Lord himself. You know, that's what he promises us. And... Uh, you keep them in first place. I have, a, I have a friend, for real, I do. I do have one friend, he's an engineer, and he's working in this firm, and uh, there was a couple other Christians in this engineering firm, and uh, they wanted to get together and to pray and dedicate the day to the Lord uh, before they started work. So he went to management and said, hey, there's a couple of Christians among us, and we'd like to use the lunchroom, you know, to pray before we start the day. It won't cost the company any money, and we won't bother anybody. You know, nobody will be in there. And so management said, no way, that's never going to happen. Well, during the same time, they were working on a project for the state of Texas. It was a bid. There was, they were bidding on this project, trying to get this contract. It had to do with a water meter that was underground for residential houses. Now, they were trying to figure out a way that they could just drive by with the magic wand, you know, and re get the reading without having to stop. Well, his company was working on it, and, another, and three or four other companies were trying to figure out a solution for this water meter because for some reason water was affecting the readings and they were being false readings. So everybody's trying to figure this out because we're talking multi, multi-million dollar contracts, you know, it's for the state of Texas. And uh, he was working on it, and, you know, they couldn't figure it out. Well, they have a prayer meeting in their church on Wednesday nights. And they had broken up and getting in groups and they're praying for one another. And he says, hey, you know, I'm at the, this job. I'm trying to figure out a solution for this problem. And, and we just can't figure it out. You think we could pray about it? And they said, sure, we'll pray about it. So well, they prayed about it that night. And about two days later, God downloads into his mind a solution. He just, boom, just saw it like that. And well, of course, if it's from God, it's going to work. And sure enough, it worked. And so their company got that contract. And so management calls him in afterwards. He say, we want to know how you figured out a solution for this problem when no other engineer could figure it out. None of the other engineering firms could figure it out. How were you smart enough, how were you smart enough to figure it out? And he says, well, I'd like to tell you I was smart enough, but he said, I could not figure it out. But in our church, we have a prayer meeting on Wednesday nights, and they, they prayed for it, and God just downloaded into my mind a solution for it. Well, management saw Prayer in multi-million dollar contracts. I guess you guys can use the lunchroom, you know. And well, this happened 15 years ago. And those Christians still get together 
and pray and dedicate the day to the Lord before they start work. It's been going on for 15 years. I tell you this story so that, you, that to give you hope. God wants to be glorified through your life wherever you work, wherever you live. It's for all of us. Because he had this chance. He remembers being in there. He had the chance. You know, I can take the glory for myself or I can give it to God. You know, and when you stand up before the unbelievers, you know, and just boom, this is the way it is. And I just was talking to him this year, and he says, you know, Kevin, I'm not that smart of a guy, but God has given me 30 patterns. Uh, patterns? Is that what they call them? Um, patents. Excuse me, I always forget. 30 patents. And he just gives the glory to God. You know, God has all the wisdom, all the power, all the love, all the, everything that we need, he can give us. But there's one thing he doesn't have. Our heart. That's a choice that we make. Okay, God, I'm going to live for your glory. No matter what happens, I'm going to put you first. Well, it seems pretty easy, wasn't it? Okay, let's live for God's glory. You know, it seems pretty simple, pretty easy thing to do. But I found that it's extremely difficult to live for the interest of another person. Because God is a person. And God does have certain interests. Okay? Can you just think about that? All the things you love, you know, all your main interests, you kind of put those aside and, you know, you're going to live for the interest of another person. It's, it's very difficult. Um, let me just give you one verse. This is in second, a couple of verses here in Philippians 2. It shows us this. <clears throat> How difficult this can be. Paul speaking, he says, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I may also be cheered when I receive news about you. For I have no one else like him, like Timothy. Now, listen closely. It says, who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. Now, what's so startling about these verses when he says everyone lives for their own interests, he's not talking about unbelievers, the pagans. He's really not even talking about the, you know, believers, Christians. He's, he's actually talking about other leaders and ministers that work with him. He says, he says, I'm going to send somebody to you, but everybody I have, he says, I can really only send one of, the, one of these leaders to you because everybody, they all live for their own interest, you know, and... Uh, but Timothy doesn't. So you, th you think about this situation. Now, what, what, what did he mean by these guys live for their own interests? Everyone lives for their own interests. Well, these were, these were ministers that worked with Paul. So you think, well, they couldn't be living in sin because, you know, Paul wouldn't put up with that. You know, they were trying to live holy lives. And I th when I think about this, I think these, these ministers were probably pretty much like you and me. God, I'm trying to live a holy life, a decent life. I'm trying not to be enslaved by sin. Now, God, please, please look out for my own interest. Look out for my interest. God, please. If you think about our prayer life, that's basically what it boils down to. It seems like if we've taken Christianity and boiled it down to, as long as I don't get too involved in sin, God's going to meet all my needs. And... Uh, well, what's it mean to live for his interest? Well, Paul tells us right here in these, in these scriptures. Um, we live for the interest of Jesus Christ by looking out for the welfare of others. It's not, you know, I think it's so, much, so super spiritual, but that's what it means. You know how Jesus said it, right? Oh, you gave a cup of water to the least of these? Well, you did that for me. You visited somebody in prison? Well, you visited me. We live for the interest of Jesus Christ when we look out for the welfare of other people. That's what it means to live for his interest. The, uh, and you think about this for a minute. You know, he says, everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Think about your own life for a second. Have you ever really been worried or, or real concerned about God's interest not being met? It's really a foreign concept to us, isn't it? 
me being worried about his interest not <laughs> being met, like he's big enough to take care of himself, you know? He should be looking out for my interest. But God calls us to put his interest first, his kingdom first. God does have interest. The, uh, well, that's really why we need this power, the Holy Spirit, so bad, you know, so that we can minister to others, you know, to the welfare of others. But as we seek to have more of this power of the Holy Spirit, we need to be even more passionate, even more passionate about falling in love with Jesus more and more every day. We never want to separate. You never want to separate these two things in your Christian life. A lot of times we have, we kind of make a separation about the great need of being more full of the Holy Spirit and about loving Jesus. But you got to keep them together at all times. The, uh, you know, when the, when the Spirit starts to use you, I'll show you the importance of keeping these together. When the Spirit starts to use in many different ways in, in, to minister to others, you get the reputation of being alive or being a man or woman of God when the Holy Spirit starts to minister to you in whatever form it might be. And uh, we have a good, bad example of this situation I'm talking about in the Old Testament through the man called Samson. Right? Samson had the anointing of the, of the Holy Spirit, mighty anointing of the Holy Spirit, right, on his life. He had this reputation of being alive, being a man of God, right? But God, and as us, you know, we always tend to look on the outside to see how God's using a person. But God always looks on the inside. It can, we could say that God's not fooled by the anointing of the Holy Spirit moving through our lives. He always looks deeper. And, uh, and we see this when Jesus, he's talking to the church of Sardis in Revelation 3.1. He says this exact same thing. He says it this way. I know your deeds, that you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Now, just remember, I'm talking to you of the dealings of the Lord in my own life. So you can fill in the blanks, however you want. And, uh, you know, the, uh, you don't get a reputation of being alive if your deeds are evil. You get a reputation of being alive when the Holy Spirit's using you. But God looks at the heart to see if you're alive. Not necessarily what's happening on the outside. The, uh, God looks to see if there's a really a burning love in our hearts for Jesus. That's what really makes us alive for God and to God. It's a burning love in your heart for Jesus. And uh, let me ask you the question. Is there a fire in your heart, a burning love for Jesus, or has it dwindled down to just a pilot light? Just a pilot light. Yeah, we know you're still saved, still going to heaven, but has it dwindled down to just a pilot light? You know, as we seek to have more of this anointing of the Holy Spirit without a growing love for Jesus, it's an extremely dangerous road to travel. Extremely dangerous. We see this in Samson. You know, he had this anointing without a growing love for God. You see it so clearly. He basically lived for his own interest, even though God was using him. Remember, and he first out, he's just first starting out in ministry. You might remember, you see this so clearly right from the day one of this anointing comes on him, and then he sees this hot pagan woman. You remember, and this is what he says. To his parents, he says, ooh, she pleases me. Get her for me. And his parents say, but isn't there at least, you know, one of the maidens among the thousands of thousands that worship Jehovah, you know, or Yahweh? And, and he, boy, he didn't, want, he wouldn't hear of it. He didn't, want, he didn't want to think, no, she pleases me. Get her for me. And that's what ruled his life. Even though he had the anointing of the Holy Spirit, he lived for his own interest. And we know how his life ended. His life ended in ruins. I mean, literally in ruins. And that still happens today. It's not something just in the Old Testament. It still happens today. It can happen to you. It can happen to me. You know, the anointing of the Holy Spirit is power to minister to others. But it doesn't really protect our heart. Jesus said it this way. He who loves me obeys me. It's our love for God that helps us to move away from the things that displease him. The, uh, <clears throat> and I've come to find out in ministry, 
It's easier to get anointing for ministry than it is to keep your heart on fire for Jesus. Let me say that it's easier to get anointing for ministry than to keep your heart on fire for Jesus. You want a couple of verses for that, right? Because <laughs> it doesn't seem like it should be true, right? The, uh, well, it's like Jesus said in Matthew 7. When they come to him, these guys come to him, and didn't we prophesy in your name, cast out demons in your name, do miracles in your name? He says, I never knew you guys, you workers of evil. You know, depart from me. And it is, you know, this, this great need of to keep this fire burning for Jesus is so extremely important for this simple reason. Um, well, think about it this way. When you really love somebody, it sure is a lot easier to live for their interest. Remember when you first started dating, falling in love? Oh, dear, let's do whatever you want to do. Oh, you want to go out to eat there? You know, it's a place you hate. Oh, let's go there, you know? When you're really in love, you can put your interest aside for their interest. And it really comes down to, to this simple fact, we live for the interest of those we really love, right? That's, that's whose interest we live for. You know, Jesus wraps up all these Ten Commandments in two, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's what we're talking about, living for God's interest, is really those two commandments, same thing. But have you ever thought about that second one? Love your neighbor as yourself. I thought, really, God? Really? <laughs> I'm thinking, God, I don't think they could handle that much affection, you know? I mean, it's just, it's so way out there, you know? Oh, you know, that's why we spend money on ourselves so easy because we love ourselves. It's easy to spend money on ourselves, but to pull money out and give it to some other interest, it costs us, doesn't it? We live for the interest of those we love. The, uh, that's why we need to tend this uh, fire in our heart for Jesus on a daily basis, because you leave that fire unattended just for a day or two, and it just burns down to a pile of light in no time. I don't know why that is. And I've ne have no nobody's ever explained it to me. But I think we all know from experience, that's the way it is. That's the way it is. You have to put wood on the fire on a daily basis, like they did in the Old Testament. The priests put wood on that fire every single day. You know, but that's, nobody else can do that for you. Your spouse can't do that for you. The pastor can't do that for you. This church service won't do that for you. You've got to make a decision. Man, I'm going to put wood on the fire every day. I know this guy that he heats his house with wood. A lot of people do up, up north. And uh, he said, you know, sometimes you get lazy, 3 o'clock in the morning, you know, you got to get up, put wood on the fire. And man, I'm not doing that today, you know. Well, then he gets up in the morning, the house is freezing, you know. And you just have to discipline yourself. You have to make some choices. How are you going to put wood on the fire, this love for Jesus, on a daily basis? What are you going to do? You've got to make some choices because, you know, it just burns down really, really quickly. The, um, well, God has, let me just mention a book that I've, we, I've probably read it four times. We enjoy it. It's called Secrets of the Secret Place by Bob Sorge. Secrets of the Secret Place. Well, you know, God has an incredibly blessed life plan for us, but it really has to do, as he said, rivers of living water flowing out of us. It's an outward-focused life, not an inward-focused life. And uh, when you really start to live for God's interest, looking out for the welfare of other people, boy, there's, there's nothing like it. I mean, that, that feeling that you get, you know, few things compare with that feeling like, man, this is what I was created for. This makes me feel fulfilled. As a Christian, have you ever felt, man, you know, being a Christian's okay, but it's not as great as they like to try to make it be. You know, there are so many Christians that feel unfulfilled in life. And that's basically because they live for their own interest. They're not living for the purpose they were created for. You can't feel fulfilled in life as a, as a Christian unless you live for the purpose you were created for. 
That means looking out for the interest of other people, right? That's how God is, and that's how he's calling us to be. But this is a, well, let me just throw in this. You remember Dorcas from the, right? Dorcas in chapter Vax? Well, she died, just like all of them. But uh, she died, she must have been too early in life. We don't know exactly all the situation, but it disturbed everybody in the church. Like they thought, man, this, is, this shouldn't be, you know. She shouldn't have had the dying. So they call Peter, go out and find Peter and bring Peter back. When Peter comes there, he's greeted by the Christians, and all these Christians have something in their hands. You remember what it was? Clothes. They all had clothes that Dorcas had made for them or other people. That was her purpose in life. She looked out for the interests of other people by making clothes. I'm telling you, this is, this is a practical thing. God has good works prepared for you so that you can feel fulfilled in life by putting his interests first, by looking out for the welfare of other people. I don't want to try to make it look, oh, you got to be a missionary and travel the world. No, right where you live. God has things for you. But you've got to call out for him saying, okay, God, I'm tired of living for myself, praying my prayer needs, God meet all my needs and, you know, and help. No, God has something for you. You know, this anointing, and that's why we this, you know, this anointing of the Holy Spirit and this flow, it talks about a flow. You know, that, I mean, that's a promise. There's a flow. And I, you know, for so many years, God has said, there's no flow of a river out of my life. I might sprinkle once in a while, you know, maybe splash, but there's no flow. And I, you know, so sought God at this. And, you know, I remember this probably about three or four years ago. I'm just praying or complaining. I'm probably the same thing. I was saying, God, I'm tired. I'm tired of pursuing this anointing and this type of lifestyle. You know, I just can't seem to get there. It seems like an impossibility. You know, I'm sorry. I mean, I'd actually say, God, I'm sorry my life doesn't bring you more glory. Because more power, more glory to God. Okay? And say, God, it just, it's not happening. I'm sorry. It just, it seems impossible. Well, during this time, the Lord spoke to, to my heart from 2 Timothy 2.10. 2 Timothy 2.10. This verse will shake up your theology. He says this, Therefore, Paul speaking, I endure everything for the sake of the elect that they too may obtain the salvation that is in Christ Jesus, you know, so that they might be saved. In, in all my discouragement at that time, this word was so clear to my heart. Kevin, you need to persevere in seeking more of the Holy Spirit and seeking to be more in love with Jesus, not for your sake, but for their sake, that they might be saved. I, that so changed my mentality because we're taught, man, you need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. And, and we do, but we always think it's like for an internal thing. No, we need the power of the Holy Spirit for their sake for their sake, that you can meet their needs. And as Paul says, so that they might be saved here. And I'll tell you, that so encouraged me because I thought, you know, for me, I could be content. Um, I could conform to just sprinkling once in a while. I could conform to that very easily because I know how hard it is to get to a place where there's a flow of the Holy Spirit. It's not an easy place. It's not an easy thing to live for the interests of another person. But when I saw so clearly that my anointing of the Holy Spirit or my lack of anointing, my love for Jesus or my lack of love for Jesus was affecting the eternal destiny of other people, I could no longer conform. Boy, we don't like to think that way. But you realize that your life, your anointing, lack of it, your love for Jesus or the lack of it, is affecting the eternal destiny of your kids, of the people you work with, family members of neighbors. Oh man, don't, don't, don't lay that on me. <laughs> you know, that's the way it is. And I know the ultimate decision is theirs. We all know that. But never underestimate the power of your life and affecting their decision. You know, we don't, we don't have what it takes. And God knows that. He has it. He'll give it to us. But he'll only give it to us if we live for his interest 
You don't get it when you live for yourself. And, uh, well, that's why we need to persevere, you know, keeping our hearts on fire for Jesus. Persevering, seeking more of the Holy Spirit, falling in love with Jesus for the sake of Auburn Hills, for the sake of Michigan, for the sake of the world. That's why we need to persevere. And in that persevering, you start to receive that fulfillment of life, the abundant life that Jesus talks about, this flow from your life. There's very few things like it. When you live for the purpose you were created for. You know, when you think about this, I'll just end with this. You know, this is really what missions is all about. When God the Father sent his own son into the world, he did that because he was looking out for your welfare. He was looking out for my welfare. When Jesus got up on that cross and took all your sin upon himself, he did that for one reason. He was looking out for your interest. Aren't you glad we have a God that looks out for the interest of others? Well, he's calling us to be like he is. God looks out for the interest of others because that's the best thing, the best way to live. There's nothing better. If there was, he'd be it. He'd live it. And he calls us to live for the interest of others for our well-being. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? If you're still alive... God has things for you to do. Amen. Pastor. Wow. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Appreciate that. I, I hope you guys understand what a profound word we have received this evening. You need to think about what our brother has brought forward as he's obeyed the Lord. And I know because um, so Wednesday night, instead of Sunday morning, we might feel like, oh, well, Midweek message, no, no. It's a profound message that we all need to get. And I don't know what stood out to you. There were several things I wrote down, but one that um, I made sure, and I'm sure this will be transferred into my, my journal, that the anointing, the anointing doesn't protect our heart. It's our love for Jesus that keeps us obedient. And, and that's so critical for us to get, especially as Pentecostals, because we tend to, we tend to focus a lot, and rightly so, on the gifts of the Spirit and the power of the Spirit, and we want that power moving through our lives, but it's not the anointing that protects our hearts, and the Scriptures make that clear. So thank you, Brother Kevin, for bringing that truth forward and everything else that you've shared with us this evening. So I think it would be appropriate for us to pray back what we've heard, and of course, in the context of that praying to pray for the work that God is doing through Brother Kevin and Karen in Spain and in Europe as a whole, that God will continue to use them as they look out for God's interests there, and then that the Lord would help us to be far more sensitive to his interests. Now, before we do that,